Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Samuel. We're going to be looking at chapters 9 through 10 as we look at the reluctant king or the man who would reluctantly become king. Or we might as well just ask this, be careful what you ask for. Have you ever heard that phrase? It's a cautionary tale or saying that suggests sometimes what we desire or request may have unintended consequences or outcomes that we didn't anticipate. Here's a couple of examples. You, you get a promotion at work. You've been seeking it. You've been desiring it. You've been praying for it. Uh, you want the greater responsibility. You want the higher salary. However, once they're receiving that promotion, they realize they find themselves overwhelmed with stress, longer hours, and less free try, try, uh, time. They may realize that the increased workload comes with sacrifices they didn't foresee. Or how about winning the lottery? Many people dream of winning a lottery, thinking it will solve all their problems and bring them happiness. But as many of you know, there's numerous stories that exist of lottery winners who were, whose lives were negatively impacted by sudden wealth and a change in relationships with their families and friends, struggling with managing their newfound fortune, and even experience strained relationships or personal crisis. Moving to a new city, you think things are going to be better on the other side of the fence. You know, that, what's that old phrase? The grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. But have you realized that because of that, they have a higher water bill? So be careful what you ask for. Start excuse me, starting a business, you think this is the way to, to get out of it, and all of a sudden you wind up that own your own business is much difficult, much harder than you ever expect. So that illustrates how desires or requests uh, can lead to unforeseen challenges or consequences, and that's what we're going to see as we look at the man who would reluctantly be king. Last week, the 12 tribes demanded that Samuel appoint a king like other nations, and that's very important, like other nations, to rule over them. They've had enough of the wickedness of Samuel's two sons who were just like Eli's, in which they were priests who were just doing things for their own benefit, uh, misusing their gifts, their talents, and the people taking and stealing from them. Samuel though, is, uh, is, is, is feels rejected by the people and goes and complains to the Lord as we saw last week, but the Lord commands them to relent. It's not you they're rejecting, they're rejecting me. So get over it, Samuel, and let's appoint them a king. God gives Samuel some warnings that he gives him that the king will be very demanding. However, we see that the people are adamant. They want a king like other nations. They're tired of these priests ruling over them. In reality, what they're doing is they no longer want God to rule over them by sending judges when needed. The Lord points out that this demand for a king is going to come at a high cost as they reject his authority. Tim Chester, a pastor who wrote a little commentary on this, notes this, I believe it's here on the monitor, he says, the writer of Judges suggests that the moral chaos in Israel was because they had no king. Remember, there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. He goes on to say, God has promised a king Moses had predicted a king, as we saw these things last week. And the writer of Judges sees the need for the king, but they envision a very different king from the one of, from whom the people ask. The people ask for a king like those of other nation. God envisions a king who will rule under him. But they no longer want God to rule over them. So as you and I now come to 1 Samuel uh, chapter 9 and 10, the author of 1 Samuel introduces us to the man who would reluctantly be anointed king and unite the 12 tribes as one nation under one rule. At first glance, Saul does look the part. However, as you see, you must be careful what you ask for. So with that, open your Bibles, 1 Samuel chapter 9. We're going to look at the first two verses as we go through these passages. I believe the first two is going to be up here. Excuse my uh, any, any mispronunciations of these men, their names. However, we're going to go through it. There was a man of Benjamin, whose name, wa or whose name was Kish, the son of Abel, the son of Zorah, the son of Bekorath, son of Aphia, a Benjamite, a man of wealth. 
And he had a son whose name was Saul, a handsome young man. And there was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. Father, we thank you for this passage of Scripture. Again, we want to do the hard work of observing what you're writing in this chapter, finding out what it means and interpreting, and then doing the work of applying it to our lives. We thank you for your word, for it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that we may be complete, perfect, mature in you. And Father, that's what we want to be. Your promise is to conform us into the image of your Son. And we know that these are your inspired words used to build and edify us up. And so let that be the work done today. And let me uh, speak your words. Let us know the difference between uh, my mere opinion and my judgment and the words of God. And may the Holy Spirit have free reign. We thank you for your kindness. In your name we pray. Amen. Now, Saul, as we observe some things from this passage, is Saul was the son of a wealthy man. Describes as very handsome and the tallest in the land. That sounds like a, a fairy tale already starting. If you were to hire consultants <clears throat> to pick a political candidate or a, 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 you know, a political candidate or a king just by looking at him, Saul would be your pick. He is what would be considered a candidate straight out of central casting. That's a phrase, it's an expression that means someone or something is a perfect fit or the stereotype for a specific role or situation. It's often used to describe a person who looks exactly like a character from a movie or a television show if it was created by a casting agency specifically for that role. I think of men that, that when I think of like presidents or, or rulers or, or men of action in movies and TVs, I think of people like John F. Kennedy. You know, I, for those of you who grew up during that time, he was a very romantic figure. Uh, even until this day, you think of John F. Kennedy as a, as a strong, good looking and talented. Uh, now there may be other things as well, but we look at just his physical appearance. He's kind of the epitome of what we want as a president. I think of Ronald Reagan and, and the looks and, and his demeanor and the way he could communicate. I think of people like, and now, now I'm dating myself as I'm thinking of Robert Redford or, or George Clooney. Or, I, I don't even know what it might be at this day, day of age for young people, Miles, T T or Miles Teller or something of that nature. But there's people in which they look the part, you know, that you just look at them and say, those, that person would make a good candidate. Pastor Tim Chester, again, points out that unlike Eli and Samuel's sons, Saul listens to his father. Hey, there's some donkeys missing. Go find them. Okay, where did they go? Well, just go out throughout the land of Israel and look for these donkeys. He's obedient. His father asked Saul to go look, and Saul obeys. Moreover, he listens to his new father figure, as we're going to see, Samuel, as he takes him under his wing. He's a fine-looking man. He's self-effacing. He does not grasp at power, as we shall see. And he's generous to his opponents. Chester points out that Saul becomes king in four stages. So if you like to take notes, the first stage is his secret anointing by Samuel. His secret anointing by Samuel. In 1 Samuel chapter 9, look at verse 15. We read this. Now the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed to Samuel, tomorrow about this time, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be prince over my people. Could you underline that phrase, prince over my people? And then this next one, he shall save my people from the hand of the Philistines. For I have seen my people because their cry has come to me. When Samuel saw saw Saul, that's a mouthful, the Lord told him, here is the man whom I spoke to you, he is who shall restrain my people. And if you can underline that, shall he shall be prince and restrainer. Now, for reasons not given here in Scripture, the Lord instructs Samuel to prepare a dinner after seeing him, with Saul given a prominent place among the 30 other guests that are there. And I'm, I'm assuming that you've read the passage. Again, I try to put it on Facebook of what we're doing. If you didn't get it, uh, I'll try to put it on Slack and let you know. But uh, in this, uh, hopefully you've read most of this. But this is kind of what's happening in 1 Samuel 9 through 10. 
Interesting, in this, in this dinner that, that Samuel is hosting with Saul at the prominent place, neither the guests nor Saul is told about Saul's future position as the prince of, and restrainer of Yahweh's people. After the dinner, before he heads home, we read in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 27, that as they were going down to the outskirts of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Tell the servant who was with him to pass on before us. And when he had passed on, he says, stop here yourself for a while that I may make known to you to the word of God. So at this point, Samuel has no idea why all of a sudden Samuel is treating him with this, this, oh, this, this, as a man of honor. He doesn't understand why he's having all this, but he's about to find out. Then Samuel took a flask of oil and he poured it on Saul's head. And kissed him and said, Has not the Lord anointed you to be prince over his people Israel? Rhetorical question. And you shall reign over the people of the Lord, and you shall save them from the hand of the surrounding enemies. Now, you have to remember, the the whole life now here, the whole tenor of Saul's life just changed that moment. One minute, he's a farmer, son of a wealthy man, who's out uh, scouring the countryside to find some lost donkeys. He ends up anointed as the king of Israel. He didn't seek it out. There was no politician here. There's, there's no candidating or, or no uh, big uh, uh, vote that's happening here. It's all of a sudden God says, there's your man. Samuel looks at him and says, wow, what a man's man. And says, I'm going to make him. And then secretly, not in front of everyone else, he does this. The second stage, though, as we continue includes a personal confirmation by Samuel's prophecy. If I was Saul, I would say, okay, what does this mean? And I'm really not sure who you are. By what authority are you going to do this? It's only you and I around. We don't even have a witness to tell everyone what's happening. Uh, What's going to happen here? So Samuel then says to him, there are several things that are going to happen. Look at chapter 10. We're now in chapter 10. The second part of verse 1. And this shall be a sign to you that the Lord has anointed you to be prince over his heritage. So here's some signs for you to know that what I just did is real, is concrete. You are the man. The three signs then include that two men, as his journey back home, that two men will inform Saul that the donkeys that he's been looking for have been found and they're back at home. Then he will run into, after that, Three men who will offer him bread along the journey back home. Three men will just out of the blue see and say, hey, here's some bread. The fourth one is an encounter with a group of prophets where surprisingly and amazingly, Saul will join them in prophesying as the Holy Spirit rushes upon him. And all of a sudden people are looking and saying, is Saul now named one among the prophets? He's prophesying. Now in verse 7 of chapter 10, Samuel instructs Saul, now when these three signs meet you, do what your hand finds to do, for God is with you. At that time, you should know then what God is going to do. So the second one includes uh, some personal confirmation. Now, as we move to the third stage, we see it's a public selection by lot. A public selection by lot. After telling Saul to go back home, and to offer his burnt offerings and peace offerings to the Lord, he was to wait seven days for Samuel's arrival, who will then come to Saul's house with more instructions of the next step in waiting to become king. When Saul's uncle asked about his journey and what happened, who did you meet? Uh, And when he finds out that Samuel was the one that he met, Saul doesn't share any of the details of what happened. I don't know about you, but if God had gotten anointed king of the world, you know, I think I'd probably tell someone, you know, hey, dad, guess what happened to me? You know, maybe your, your friend, maybe your worst nemesis, your enemy, maybe you might tell him, hey, you better treat me right. Maybe his brother, his sister, whatnot. But he keeps it secret. Even when his uncle says, well, what did Samuel tell you? What did you talk about? What happened? But Saul here is quiet. He's kind of self-effacing. 
I would suggest probably maybe he wasn't really sure even what's going on, even with the confirmation, with all the things that just happened to him that he's not really sure. But for some reason, he doesn't share the details. But then as we go to the next, the fourth stage, the last stage, we see now Saul ascending to the king of Israel is now a victorious confirmation by the people. So in 1 John, or 1 John, 1 Samuel rather, in chapter 10, verse 17, we get a look at what's happening at that day. Now, again, as we think about lots, this is, in many ways, as we think of lots, it's almost like picking straws. You remember those, that old game you used to play as a kid? You would, to see who would go first, you would pick a straw, and they were all different sizes, and either the short one got the end of the stick, or the long one, whatever you might change, or what they would do in those days, many times they would just would have, in this case, 12 stones. And what they would do is they would throw 12 stones, and each stone had a name of a tribe. And as we're going to see, this is what happens. We'll go a little bit more into it. But this is what's about to happen. They're going to choose him by lot. Now, Samuel, in verse 17 of, of, uh, of chapter 10, now Samuel called the people together. That's speaking of the elders and the leaders and the people of the 12 tribes, together to the Lord at Mizpah. And he said to the people of Israel, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, I brought you out of Egypt, Israel out of Egypt, and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hands of all the kingdoms that were oppressing you. But today, now he wants to make, make a point, but today you have rejected your God. In other words, they no longer want God to rule over them who saves you from all your calamities and your distresses, and you have said to him, set a king over us. So Yahweh wants to put it very clear. You're about to get what you asked for. Now, therefore, present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. Instead of then announcing Saul as king, he knows who God has chosen, Samuel brings all the people before him and begins to cast lots. Again, as we talked about. So you can imagine there's these 12 rocks or 12 whatever they are, and they have the names of all the tribes of Israel, all 12 of them. And so what we're going to do is you go through this, you're going to see that they throw it down. And what would happen is as he throws down those, those, those objects, Benjamin comes up. So they say, okay, all the other ones come up. All the tribes, of, all the clans now of, of, of Benjamin come up. And then again, they throw different clans and they, were, they had major clans in which those heads. And then they would name those and so on and so forth. And as that clans come up, and then there would be different names. Eventually, this was most likely, by the way, to confirm God's choice. This is how God would show his providence, his sovereign will in which the lot would fall. It kind of goes off of Proverbs where it says, man casts the dice, but God decides where it lands. So that, remember that the next time you're Tempted to go to Marengo? Okay, just, just, just a side note. Eventually the lot came down to the tribe of Benjamin. Then it came to the clan of Kish, the wealthy man. And then finally, as they then look at all the men, they cast the lot and it finally falls upon Saul. However, in a strange turn of events, Saul is nowhere to be found. Where's Saul? Everyone, where's Saul? The lot fell on him. Where is Saul? And so they go looking for him, and eventually they find him that he's hiding behind the baggage, the luggage of all the things that people, remember, they're traveling to the city, so their donkeys, their wagons, their luggage, they find him hiding. Now, this is the king that God has anointed. He's the tallest. He's the handsomest. He's wealthy, but yet here he is hiding from the people. Eventually he was found. And in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 24, I believe this might be here on the monitor, but you may want to look in your scripture as well. And Samuel said to all the people, Do you see him who the Lord has chosen? There is none like him among all the people. And the people shouted, Long live the king. They're happy. They're rejoicing. They got what they wanted. A king like the other nations. Our passage concludes quite suddenly, though, as Samuel recites the rights and duties of the king. It's not given to us, but it just tells us that's what he does. And afterward, everyone returns to their own home, including King Saul. 
There's no grand march back to Shiloh or another important city. At this time, Jerusalem was not the capital. There was no grand coordination that we're used to seeing in movies or watching as King George and Queen Elizabeth and so on and so forth. When we return to chapters 11 of 1 Samuel next week, or actually in two weeks, I should say, we're going to find that King Saul is still working in his father's fields, doing whatever it is that he would do in the field. Everything, though, is not rosy, as in 1 Samuel chapter 10, it ends on a sour note in verse 26. Saul also went home to, went to his home at Gabeah, and with him went men of valor, whose hearts God has touched. Now, that sounds wonderful. All of us want to be surrounded by men of valor, ready to, to do whatever we want at a moment's notice. But some, it goes on, some worthless fellows. You can see the connection there with uh, Judges, where it talks about how many of the judges had worthless fellows that follow him. Uh, the worthless fellows, could just you could just insert in there politician, if you'd like, and says, how can this man save us? They look at him and say, yeah, he's tall. Yeah, he's handsome. He comes from a wealthy family. But how in the world can this man, who's hiding in the baggage, how can this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no present. But Saul held his peace. He held his peace. Now it's time for us to turn and consider this passage and how it's profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, righteousness, instruction for righteousness. And going back to our introduction in this series, we discovered that this book had three themes. I don't know if you remember those, so we're going to go through those. And I'm going to share with you, I think, what we're trying to find through Scripture, what this is telling us. The first is you and I look at chapters 9 through 10, not only the whole book, but, but 9, 10, you see first is that the kingship is of God. God is the first king. We need to recognize that they are rejecting his rule. Only God alone determines who will stand before him and mediate his kingdom and no other. So when you and I even look at this world, it is God who decides who rules over us. You know, there's that old phrase, we get the politicians or the presidents or the rulers, the governors that we deserve. Uh, and I believe that's true. But in the end, you and I one day are going to, here in November, we're going to cast our lots or cast our votes. And we're going to determine. But let us always remember that that's always under the kingship of God who determines who rules. The time indeed has come when the people demand a king, one that is like other nations. But even this demand is rooted in the truth that Israel is his chosen pe people, but yet God, God, God I'm, I'm putting God and Yahweh together. I'm not sure I, that's a good thing to do. But God is the one who is still their king. Theologian Robert Bergen writes in the New American Con uh, Commentary about this passage. He says, Samuel also gives Saul his first lesson about the relationship that was to exist between Israel, the king, and Yahweh's prophet. Under the Lord's inspiration, he writes, Samuel and the later prophets had the right to prescribe royal behavior. Furthermore, the plans of Saul and all the Israelite kings who would come after him were to subordinate themselves to the prophetic word. You must wait until I come to you and tell you what you are to do. So in here, God is giving really, uh, uh, he, he just, as we saw earlier, Samuel was the first prophet, that's a new rule, and now a role, and now we're seeing a new role, a new office, that's the king. They were to work together. In many ways, the king would almost be under uh, the prophet when it comes to God's mediation. In Israel's monarchy, royal authority was derived and secondary. The king was always to be under the Lord's Authority, And as you work your way through the Old Testament, you'll see many times a prophet coming in saying, thus saith the Lord. And you see kings who either obeyed it or kings who didn't and the consequences that would come. So in here, we see that God is not giving up his role as the rightful king of all things. Since the Lord's true prophets were conduits through which the divine word came to kings, Robert says, these prophets were fun functionally superior positions to royalty. Royal power would have divinely set 
limits. They could not do just what they wanted to do. And the Lord's prophets would define those limits. We see that with Nathan and uh, David. We'll see that uh, probably next year as we look at 2 Samuel. Samuel's words to Saul were thus the opening volley in an enduring struggle between human political will and divinely inspired religious conscience. So you and I could easily see that God is still king. He's still king today. And even today, even as you and I um, will vote and get determined, at least here in the United States, who our rulers, who our lesser magistrates are, we're to put that under the conscience of God and his word. This harkens back to the opening chapters of Genesis, where God created all things visible and invisible in Genesis 1. And he set his man as regents, or smaller kings, I should say, to work and keep the garden. All things were subject, subjugated to man as he would mediate and rule as God's ambassadors on earth, accomplishing the purposes and plans of God. So when Saul is anointed king, he is not taking the place of Yahweh. Now, that's what the people wanted. They were tired of the authority of God, but God gives them a prophet, then he gives them a king, and he says, these two will work together to rule and mediate my kingdom. That goes for today, by the way, as well. So secondly, not only is it the kingship of God, but it's also God's providential guidance throughout the world. Despite human evil and suffering, God is at work at all times. The times of judges was a wicked time full of evil, chaos, and violence. Now, couldn't that not be said even for today? Yet God hears, God remembers, and God responds to his children's plea for deliverance. We can vividly see the Lord's hand in moving the characters into place here in 1 Samuel 9 and 10. The donkeys go go missing. Why? Because God scattered them. How did they get back to Saul's house? God gathered them back. How does Samuel or Saul find Samuel? We're going to see he uses his servants. What do we see? How does Samuel know to anoint Saul? Because God put it all together. God is always moving things together for his purpose. Even today, as we look at this world, and we can bemoan many things politically, culturally, religiously in this world. However, we have to understand that it's always God's hands that is moving the pieces. God is not responding to our move as if we could get him into check or to checkmate. It's always God moving all things together for his purpose. And by the way, for our good, amen? Even your pain, even your suffering, even your disappointments are all part of, part of God's plan to put things together. Thirdly, his sovereign will and power are always on display. We need to recognize that. At this point, if you were just Samuel, you can see why Samuel feels rejected. He has this new role of a prophet, He's a good man. He's a godly man. But somehow, as a father, he's a miserable failure in a respect that his sons are very evil. They're just like the sons of Eli. Except in this case, at least they're not killed at this point. God doesn't take their lives. But yet they're rejected. And so Saul in this case, or Samuel, excuse me, in this case, may say, you know, God's lost his power. I'm telling you, God is the one who has saved you. He has saved you all your calamity, and you're going to leave him? What in the world is this going to come to? But you and I need to understand that God is the all-knowing God, a God of knowledge, and he chooses or rejects people according to his absolute sovereign will and purpose. You and I use different methods of choosing our leaders, choosing the people that will influence us, that will listen to, obey, so on and so forth. But in here, we see that God's sovereign will and power are always on display. And yes, as we look through Judges, it is true that God many times will use flawed, sinful, rebellious people for his purposes. We must understand that. Saul is anointed as the prince. 
the leader, the ruler, the captain of his people, who will stand as God's mediator and protector against his enemies. He is also described as the restrainer, meaning that he leads his people back to Yahweh. Remember, there was no king. Everyone was did what was right in their own eyes, but they're given, he's given a, 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 a kind of a, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? A, a model of how he is to bring the people back, the guardrails, the, the covenant, the ma, law of Moses, so that they may obey the commandments given to them through Moses and to judge with justice and righteousness. So God, as we see here, is the kingship of God. He has not given over control. He providentially moves things the way they are. And his sovereign will and power are on display, even when it seems that God is far away. Now, as I said earlier, Saul at first glance seems like a great catch and straight out of central casting. Yet we'll also discover that he's incompetent, dishonest, prideful, and lacks integrity. In our passage this morning, there are several warnings, warning signs that Saul is not all that Samuel and the people thought he was not. Now, and I think those worthless fellows actually were onto something. They actually saw something in Saul that they said, this is not a man worth following. Theologian, again, Robert Bergen, in his commentary, writes that there are at least three factors that are remarkable, or three features that are remarkable about the brief interchange between Saul and his servant that would give us reasons to pause and say, just because he's good looking, just because he's tall, just because he may emanate strength, is this really the man that should lead us? So let me give you those three. First is the, future's king, the future king's profound ignorance of Samuel. Now, if we were to go back in 1 Samuel chapter 9, you would have saw that. That Samuel lived nearby, and though was known to all of Israel, as we've seen in chapters eight, in, or chapter seven and eight, and that uh, that that Saul uh, did not know who Samuel was. The young slave that was with him did. He was the one who said we should go to Samuel the prophet. But it seems odd that Saul, the son of a wealthy man, would not know who was Samuel or who Samuel was and where Samuel was based where he lived. We saw that he was a circuit rider. He knew this is the circuit he would take each and every time that he would go and preach. But what we see here is that he's ignorance of the man of God. But also, secondly, is Saul's failure to consider the seeking divine help in the trials of life. If you're going back to 1 Samuel chapter 9, you see that at no point as he's looking for his dad's donkeys, not once does he say, you know what, maybe we should pray about it. How often do we do that, right? For most of us, prayer is something that we do like, it's like that, that fire hose over there, break, you know, when needed. We wait till a fire happens, right? Or, or things have gotten that bad. He doesn't seek God's advice. If I was looking for donkeys in a wild land that was big and long, I think I might sit down and pray a little bit. But in this case, he doesn't. It was Saul's slave not Saul himself, who recognized the need for spiritual help. Hey, let's, let's, go, let's go to Samuel. Let's ask him if he knows where those donkeys are. The future king's life at this point was devoid of spiritual sensitivity that looked for the Lord's help. And this, by the way, is going to be his Achilles heel throughout his reign as king, as you and I will see as we continue on over the next few weeks, is that many times Saul would act without seeking spiritual help. How often do we do that ourselves? And third, the third warning sign is Saul's assumption that the spiritual favors that he was wanting once he saw Saul, Samuel, this is getting really hard, had to be bought. Going back to 1 Samuel 9, though some unscrupulous prophets might have demanded some money for prayer, for an offering, no true servant of the Lord would. And if you read 1 Samuel 9 before you came in here, you would see that's one of the things he does. Well, I have no offering to bring to him. I have no gift. And the servant is the one who's the godly one, not Saul himself. In addition, I noticed that there was one other major issue in that Saul was not from the tribe of Judah. 
Now, if you know the word of God as these 12 tribes, these Hebrew children should have, and Samuel himself, we have already covered that the promise of God is that a king would come from the tribe of Judah. Yet when they're doing the lots and it comes and Judah's not chosen, instead they choose Benjamin, no one seems the wiser. No one says, oh, wait a second, maybe we ought to do that again. I, I think we've made a mistake. Yet neither Samuel, Saul, nor the people seem to bring this issue up or question it. One reason is their desire, and again, and this is the phrase I wanted you to consider, is to have a king like other nations. They want a man who's tall, who's handsome. They want a man that they have no problem standing up in front of others and saying, that's our leader. We're the same way, right? We want leaders who look the part. We want leaders who, 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 who believe the way we do. We want people to look at them and say, look at our leader. The problem was that people were making judgment based on looks and achievements rather than character and conviction. They were enamored, as you might remember, with the Canaanite kings. We want kings like the nations around us. We want these warriors who were described by their forefathers in Numbers 13. It says, we're not able to go against these people, for they are stronger than we are. The land through which we have gone to spy out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people they saw in it are of great height. Here and there we saw the Nephilim. And we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers. That's how big and large they were. And so we seemed to them. They want men like that to lead them. They were easily satisfied with men who were tall and handsome and played the part. The land of Canaan was filled with the descendants of men who were very tall and strong and violent. Later, the author of 1 Samuel will introduce a man named Goliath. He's a Philistine soldier that stood 10 foot or 10 foot and 6 inches or 9 feet and 6 inches. Even Samuel is moved by the physical stature and appearance of Saul when he sees him in his mind. He himself says, wow, that must be the man. And again, we shall see in several weeks that he repeats that same error when he comes to King David or little David. He fits the part. This must be the man. So the Lord gives them exactly what they wanted. Again, reminding us of the phrase, be careful what you ask for. As Saul winds up being a disaster of a king. Now, before we're too harsh on Samuel, the people in Saul, we have to admit that you and I are too are guilty of judging the book by the cover. We too are desperate for leaders who look the part without much consideration of the character and conviction of the person. <clears throat> we are easily persuaded to overlook someone's fault, someone's sin, as long as they meet a certain earthly, worldly stature, standard. The problem is, is that standard is based on the world's view, like Israel, rather than God's. And of course, the ancient people, like ancient Israel, we have the paid the price for that. We need men and women who, as we've seen before, will boldly obey God's word in defiance of circumstances and consequences. We need men and women who are ready to stand up and do what God needs of us. We need today people that are, live a character, who live out their faith. Their character is one that's godly. We need men and women of conviction, people who are grounded in the word of God. They live out that which they believe, and what they believe is ruled by God's word. We need men and women of courage, people who are ready to live in defiance of the world. It doesn't matter what's going on. It doesn't matter the circumstance. It doesn't matter the consequence. And fourthly, we need people who have counted the cost, who are ready to pay. I was just reading this. Oh, I wish I would have bookmarked it and had it today. It it didn't occur to me at the time. I read it last night on Twitter. Uh, In many churches, when you go uh, for baptism, and by the way, if you are in need of baptism, could you please let me know? Uh, We'd love to to share with you that ordinance and what that means. But in baptism, they're they're used to the thing where they say, are you ready? Do you do this? Do you believe this? 
And this is something that's happened from the beginning of the church. But one African church in Gahana, which is an African nation, which is a nation many times in turmoil, their baptism requirements was, do you, do you, and I'm going to paraphrase because again, I didn't save it, is do you, um, do you renounce the world? Okay. This is what they're asking them publicly before they baptize them. Not talking about membership, just to baptize them. Are you ready to have you to leave your family if they dis, if they disobey God? Are you ready to die for the sake of Christ? I mean, I wish I would have gotten it because just reading them is like, oh my goodness. Like someone says, I was reading this earlier earlier today. You know, we take that uh, Philippians four thirteen. I can do all things through Christ, and then we remember that you won't come to church if it's raining. What's that about? That's how we are. But we need men and women of courage, of character, of conviction, and, 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 and that are ready to count the cost. We looked at that verse last week. The Bible is full of men and women like this. I think of Moses, Joshua, Elijah, Elisha, Daniel, the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, John the Baptist, who lost his head rather than to give up the word of God, the disciples, and even Paul. The Fox's Book of Martyrs have many. And what's not written is those that are living in countries today like China and Iraq and Iran and others who are killed and persecuted for their faith. You and I celebrate Easter with Easter egg hunts, pretty dresses and flowery hats. I was just talking to uh, Lydia the other day when it came to the Orthodox Easter in Egypt. It's celebrated by the burning of churches and the burning of homes and the raping of their women and the killing of their men as they attend church. Boy, could you imagine that? There's no helicopters dropping eggs. Would you go to a church knowing that's what's going to happen on that day? The Lord has promised that he will send us a prince, amen? And a restrainer who will lead his people. Samuel and the Hebrew children were hopeful that Saul would be that man. Since the days of Adam and Eve, every woman and every man would think of that son might be that coming prince, the snake crusher. And at this time, they think Saul's going to be that man. They have seen their hopes, though dashed one by one, as one king after another failed to live up to that promise to be the prince and the restrainer. Even today, they are looking and anticipating the day that their Messiah will come. Yet you and I know that the prince and the restrainer has already appeared to save his people from their sin. Amen? The snake crusher has already defeated the dragon, and he is building his kingdom one heart at a time as they submit to the authority of God as king. Though Saul will fail in his attempts to lead and rule, the Lord has anointed the true king of Israel, Jesus Christ. He's sent by the Father to be the final prince and restrainer. He's anointed to be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And he does all this not reluctantly, but obediently, willingly, joyfully, the Bible tells us. You see, Jesus is the rightful king. It is he that the Lord has anointed to be the king and restrainer of his people. When standing before Pilate, you might remember that Jesus was asked, so are you a king? That was the, one of the accusations against him, one of the charges. And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. And for this purpose, I was born. And for this purpose, I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. And everyone who's of the truth listens to me. So Jesus is that rightful king, the anointed one of God, of God the prince, the restrainer. Number two, we see that Jesus is one that God has providentially moved throughout history to be that rightful king, to be there for Joseph and Mary to give birth for his incarnation. And then he moved all of the pieces in together to where all things come together in Jerusalem, where were gathered those who would crucify Christ. The apostle Paul writes, you see here on scripture, that because of this, that God's design was to providentially decree that God has highly exalted Jesus 
and has bestowed on him a name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow. And we talked about this earlier in our adult core class. Yes, Hitler will bow before Christ. Putin will bow and put the knee before Christ. The worst sinner will bow their knee before Christ and submit to his lordship. In heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. And then thirdly, Jesus' reign will usher in peace and justice until all things. Saul does not do that. We'll see a glimpse of it through David and Solomon's reign and through others. But what we're going to see is Saul will not because only Jesus can do that. For God has put all things under subjection unto the feet of Jesus Christ. So as you come to a close, let us be men and women whose hearts are touched by God, rather than worthless fellows who question, how can this man save us? It's sad to this day that people still question how Jesus can save us. John MacArthur warns about those who falsely profess Christ, who may say, okay, Saul is king, but in my heart he's not. There are some who say Jesus is king, but he's but in their heart. He warns this, for a Jesus is the true king. He is deserving of all exaltation, all praise, all worship, all adoration. But the true king was offered a false coronation like Saul. There are masses of people who are interested in Jesus only because someone told them that they can get from him what they want. They see Jesus as a source to get what they want. As long as Jesus would meet their desires, feed them uh, food, they would hail him as king. This kind of false coronation of Jesus goes on all the time. And as we come together, you and I through through the table here are about to coronate Jesus as king. Say, he is king. Submit to him. I pray today that as you take of the elements, that you are not making a false sense of worship. So let us be men and women of character, conviction, courage, counting the cost to obey God. Why? Because Jesus is king. Revelations 5.13, I close with this. And I heard every creature in heaven and earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. To God be the true King. Amen? Let us pray. Again, I'm going to ask Randy to make his way up. And I want you to just take a moment to pause and consider what we've shared here this morning. And then lift up in prayer to respond how the Holy Spirit may call you this morning. It may be different ways and different thoughts, but we respond to the goodness of God as Randy joins, comes with us in prayer. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Walking in Faith. We encourage you to share this with others. If you have any questions or comments, please visit us online or email us at info at orangevilla.org. Till next time, may God bless you in everything you do.